Just be seated for a moment, please. Good morning. Isn't it lovely to have a response when you say good morning? <laughs> I have to say it's been a strange experience in the last few weeks, the last couple of months, just being on my own in church, and it's lovely to see human beings in front of me this morning, and I'll be able to see how you're responding as I preach to you, as they say, rather than just preaching into a camera or whatever. And just to remind you that although we've returned to church, the same restrictions as to what we do in church apply as they did before. There'll be no plate passed around for your offering. If you haven't done already, you can place your offering in the plate at the door as you leave. And please remember at the end of the service to wait in your pew until one of the church wardens directs you to leave. As we return to St. James's for our summer services, we have brought one of the prayer trees from Holy Trinity into the foyer of St. James's, and there are labels and pens available beside the tree if you would like to request a, pra request a prayer for anyone. You can place the label on the tree yourself, or alternatively, you can write a label and place it in the collection plate, and we will place it on the tree for you. Next Sunday services, where we're hoping to return to Colfetran after a break of over a year next Sunday morning for our 9.30 service, which will be a service of morning prayer. And then that will be followed by a service of Holy Communion here in St. James's at 11.30 a.m. And we're using the services printed on the screen, the order for morning prayer this morning. So let's just bow our heads in prayer for a moment. Our Easter celebrations continue with the familiar upper room appearances from John's Gospel. This year the readings highlight a feat to the resurrection that can easily be missed. The way Christ's resurrection brings us into a unified, loving community in which we share joy and abundant life together. Dear Lord, may we find life in our connection with each other, with the world and with you, as we worship together this morning. Amen. We open our worship with hymn number 228, Meekness and Majesty.
be with you. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand? O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. As our canticle this morning, we're using the Easter anthems, so we join together in the words as they appear on the screen. Christ our Passover, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven of corruption and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Christ, once raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. In dying, he died to sin once for all. In living, he lives to God. See yourselves, therefore, as dead to sin, and alive in God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ has been raised from the dead, the fruits of those who sleep. For as by man came to death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Please be seated for our first reading. A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, beginning at the 32nd verse. During the Easter season, we hear the experiences of those who were witnesses to the resurrection. Despite continuing harassment by the Jewish authorities, the believers in Jerusalem, the disciples, began to develop a new style of community life under the apostles' leadership, sharing everyone and sharing everyone and meeting everyone's needs. Now the whole group of those who believe were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold, they laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with hymn 112, There is a Redeemer. Hymn number 112.
Please be seated for our second reading. A reading from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, beginning at the 19th verse. On the first Easter evening, Jesus appears to his disciples with his habitual greeting of peace and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thomas must wait another week until he can see and also believe. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the marks of the nails on my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm sure perhaps there's one or two, I know there's one or two in the congregation this morning who would uh, work at motor vehicles sometimes, but have you ever heard the phrase running on the smell of an oily rag? Or one might use the phrase running on fumes or running on empty. As you say, it's a, few, a phrase we might use when talking about how little fuel there is left in the car and how far we still have to go. Nowadays, with the more modern cars, you usually get plenty of warning, tells you how many miles you've left and so on. And it's not that easy to run out of petrol or diesel. It wasn't like that a few years ago when the older vehicles, all you had was a red line on your fuel gauge and you might have chanced it a bit further, perhaps to your cost. And if you're driving a diesel, you're definitely in trouble if you run out of diesel. But if you did run low, somehow you get to your destination and you'd know that you were really low when you filled up your tank and it took the maximum amount that it could hold. So the car must have been running on fumes or as the saying goes, on the smell of an oily rag. Sometimes it's a bit like that in our life journey. We're flying along with a full tank but a few steep hills and sharp curves and sudden stops sucks up our fuel and soon we are pretty much running on fumes, running our empty. We're anxious, stressed, discouraged, and wondering how much bleaker the future could possibly get. Has anyone ever felt something like that? At some time all of us hit a few potholes that buckles our rims and leaves us stuck at the side of the road. But that's enough of the motoring metaphors this morning. Apart from adding that today's gospel tells us the disciples were at the end of the road. So they too were running on empty. In our reading from John's gospel, we're taken back to that first Easter day. Only now it's the evening time. They've heard the account of the women and Peter and John have seen the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene told them about her encounter with the gardener who turned out to be the risen Lord. No doubt she too was a good deal, told that with a good deal of excitement. 
But now as night fell, the excitement of Easter morning gave way to fear. The disciples were not hiding behind the locked doors. They felt vulnerable and unsafe. They were truly afraid. And they had every reason to be afraid. The temple authorities had been out to get Jesus for months, repeatedly seeking ways to get rid of this troublemaker, trying to trap him and making statements that could use, he could use against him. The disciples also knew from experience that the chief priests and other religious authorities were very determined in the end got what they wanted. The death of the man who they believed undermined their authority and challenged their religious beliefs, their religious practices more so perhaps. The disciples believed they might be the next ones to be dragged away and treated like Jesus. Their fear was so intense that they forgot what Jesus had told them. He had warned them that he would be going away and told them not to be worried and to put their trust in God. But at that moment all the words of hope and comfort disappeared from their thoughts because all they could feel was the present danger and the fear in their hearts. When people are afraid and downhearted like this, there are often other contributing factors that heighten the sense of helplessness. For the disciples, it was physical tiredness was a factor. It had been a long and tense few days from the night of the Last Supper and the betrayal of Judas, the trials to Jesus' death and burial up until now. And I'm sure they were emotionally drained. The person they had loved, the one who had loved them so much and had been so very patient with them, the man who had loved people with so much compassion had been treated so cruelly. And I'm sure they were asking, how can this happen? They grieved over their own behavior for the past few days. They felt guilty. They had let Jesus down so badly. They had scattered at the first sign of trouble. They felt isolated, alone and helpless. Anxious and uncertain what the future might bring. They were at a very low spiritual point. Everything they'd hoped for, believed in, relied on had evaporated. What about the Messiah they had hoped for? Did they even dare think that God had some other plan? And the icy hands of fear and futility gripped their hearts and their minds were clouded with confusion. They were stunned, confused, distressed. People without hope. Because the meaning of the Easter morning hadn't become real and personal for them. And without a doubt the disciples were running on empty. Still feeling that Jesus was no longer with them. Sometimes when we're running on empty, it can feel as if God is a million miles away. And the more questions that we ask, the more confused we become because you want answers that don't seem to be available. Answers to those questions. It's just when the disciples were feeling isolated, alone, wondering, and later to see in Thomas's case even doubting, that Jesus is closer than we think. When those whom he loves are empty and downhearted, he doesn't wait for them to come to him. He comes to them. He goes to where they are and steps into the middle of their fear and confusion and questioning. He even comes to Thomas who says he won't believe until he's seen the marks of the nails and the spear. Thomas is so shaken by the whole Easter experience but Jesus just knows just what he needs. Jesus knows exactly what we need when we're exhausted and tired and downhearted, even doubting and confused. I want to make four observations, quick observations this morning about this visit of Jesus to the disciples. Firstly, what does he say when he appears into the room? He says, peace be with you. In other words, take a deep breath, it's going to be okay. If they were expecting anything, that was not what they were expecting. They believed they deserved at least to get behind me, Satan, as he said to Peter previously. Or you of little faith. Don't you believe that I've risen from the dead? Why are you so glum? I'm alive. Don't you know that cha that changes everything? But there are no words of criticism from Jesus. 
Just those well-known words, peace be with you. It's like he knows and understands what's going on in their hearts and minds. He doesn't need to say anything else. He knows what it's like to be running on empty. When we're surrounded by a cloud of confusion, of doubts, of anxiety, of weariness, he comes to us as well and quietly says, Peace be with you. Know that I'm here with you. I'm walking this journey with you. You're not alone. You can talk to me through prayer. You can lean on me when you're weak. I'm always here to refill your tank when you're running on low. Secondly, when we are low, Jesus simply loves us. He showed the disciples the scars on his hands and in his side, reminding them of the cross. As they gazed and reflected on the wounds of Jesus, they realized how deep and how strong and how much the Lord loved them. John wrote in his letter, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So when you and I are down and discouraged, we know that Jesus, who was wounded and died for us, he loves us totally and completely. And if he can love us all the way to the cross, surely he's not going to stop loving us now. When everything is falling apart and nothing is going right, peace and joy don't come from what is happening around us. Rather, they come from that relationship we have with Christ and his love for us. Thirdly, as I said, the disciples are struggling with guilt over failing to be a true friend to Jesus over the past few days. Jesus now comes to them and says, Peace be with you. And he announces all is forgiven. And in many ways, forgiveness is a huge re-energizer. The things that can cause us to run out of energy and drain us emotionally and physically are guilt, remorse, and sometimes resentment. They make our mindset unhappy. They suck the energy out of us. They absorb our thoughts and control our actions. How do we let go of our guilty conscience and remorse? There's only one way, forgiveness. And Jesus forgives us. His scars and words of peace prove that. But then he says, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive, then they are not forgiven. He certainly wants us to forgive one another. To show each other the same grace that he shows us, the same forgiveness. If we don't, our resentment and guilt will keep us running on empty, keep eating away at us, keep eating away at our mindset, our sense of well-being. We'll be stuck in the past and that will prevent us from moving on. And sometimes it means forgiving those who refuse to accept our hand of friendship. But that's their choice, not ours. But we know that forgiveness isn't easy. But the risen Jesus empowers us to reach out with forgiveness. And fourthly, when we are downhearted, discouraged and sad, Jesus gives us hope. Behind those locked doors, fear and doubt left the disciples thinking they hadn't a future. Nothing to look forward to. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the rest of the disciples and when he was told about Jesus' appearance, he simply said what he honestly thought. I won't believe it unless I seal the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Thomas's faith in Jesus was low. He couldn't possibly see how a dead man could come alive again. Grief and despair took over. Confidence and hope in the future were vague and thin. Even though Jesus invited Thomas to put his finger in the nail marks and in his hands and side, he didn't need to. He simply knelt before Jesus saying, My Lord and my God. Thomas was a changed man. He was suddenly renewed, refreshed and energized and filled with hope. And that's what Jesus can do for us. He fills us with hope when the chips are down and troubles are overwhelming us. We have someone who will stand by us and help us. When our lives, for example, are threatened by sickness, Jesus will give us the courage. When death looms large, Jesus has won the victory for us. When the risen Jesus walks with us on life's journey, he gives us encouragement with his calming, peaceful presence. And perhaps everything else is just chaotic. 
But I do understand this. When I say all of this, I don't want to trivialize the pain or agony or frustration that anyone is going through this, at this very moment. For you, this is real, it is a challenge, it's painful. It may even seem that God is a long way from you in your trouble. And that's what the disciples thought as they hid in that room. And even though that's how you might feel at the moment, be aware that the risen Christ is closer than you think. And he understands more about life than you realize. And he is saying to each and every one of us, peace be with you. Amen. continue as we stand to affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Collect of the Second Sunday of Easter. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And colleagues of morning prayer. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us, that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue in prayer. Living God long ago, faithful woman proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love is deep, and our faith is true. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you've called us to follow in the way of your risen Son, and to care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. Seeking to be true friends of all, we offer our prayers on behalf of the Church and the world. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, 
Those who are seriously ill in the parishes and community are present. Those who are concerned about returning to normal life after the impact of COVID. May they all particularly feel your presence and love around them in these difficult times. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing for others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, merciful and living Father, we thank you for our schools in this community. As all our young people prepare to return to school, some for the first time this year, bless those who teach and those who learn. Bless too the children throughout the world who live in difficult and dangerous situations, who do not have the opportunities or facilities we have, who live in poverty, want and fear of tomorrow. Help us to care for them and to show your love and concern in prayerful and practical ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, in a time when there is disorder and breakdown in relations in our communities, ease political tensions and bring peace to communities in conflict so that they may strive to live together in harmony. Defeat the plans of all those who stir up violence and strife. Support those who make difficult decisions in an effort to quell the violence and those who implement those decisions. Abide with the leaders of our land. Remind them that the responsibilities for government comes from you so that their decisions will be made according to your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we think of the death this week of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, Heavenly Father, in whose hands Jesus Christ commended his spirit at the last hour, into those same hands we now commend your servant Philip. We thank you for his loyal service to this country over so many years. May death be for him the gate to life and to eternal fellowship with you, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, surround the Queen and the royal family with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we conclude our prayers as we say together the words.